So, uh, hi everyone, and welcome to uh, one of the last sessions of Phosphor G 2022. I have the very, very difficult task of uh, slowly introducing you back into the Phosphor G talk mood. Uh, so, um, I hope I'll, I'll do a, a fairly decent job. <laughs> so, um, I am Kodrina Ilie. I come from. Uh, I work at a SME in Bucharest, or Signa, and today I am here to present some uh, work that we have done within a European project, a co-financed European project. It was a project that involved using phosphor G and open data, and um, the European story is basically um, a type of use case that we have tried to develop using the phosphor G and open data. Uh, I think this is okay. So the main elements are obvious: phosphor G and open data. Um, I'll just go really fast through these. These are the tools that we have used within the project that I've mentioned, and uh, that I will uh, share more in the in the following slides. Uh, we also developed uh, some uh, open source software, uh, QGIS plugin, uh, the plugin for Actinia for GeoServer, and also uh, you. A UMAP library. I will not go again into into uh, detail, but you are welcome to uh, check the um, check our GitLab. So uh, the context uh, I would like to focus more a bit related to the open data. Uh, so um, most of us here know about the open data is not is no longer such a, a novel concept, let's say. But uh, the first one of the first definitions uh, that has been uh, widely, uh, let's say, acknowledged, uh, was given in 2005 by an international foundation called Open Knowledge, and it referred to um, the fact that it means free, open means free access, that you can use, you can modify, uh, you can share, and mostly with respect uh, to, um, at most, uh, uh, needed to preserve provenance and openness. And an important aspect here to say is that um, use modify in commercial uh, in commercial uh, purposes as well. Hopefully, this definition has changed over time. In 2015, the open definition had its last uh, his mm, mm, until this point the last review. Uh, so uh, um, more information and more nuances to what open data means were were added. Uh, but open data is not really that new of a concept. In all parts of our eco, of our world, of our ecosystem, let's say, with respect to science, the first time that the open was brought into light was in the International Geophysical Year. And the, the main reason for uh, the data, the scientific data to be made open uh, within the scientific community was to avoid losing it and also for um, uh, scientific progress. And mind you that that period in time was a very complicated one with respect to the political situation of the world. And uh, the International Geophysical Year was, uh, scientific, uh, was a scientific uh, event that brought together researchers from all over the from all over the world, from Japan, from Russia, from uh, United States, so on and so forth. So it was one of the it, it, the idea of openness was beyond the uh, the political context with public administration. And here I will refer mainly to the European Union because the story is related to the European Union space. Um, the first mentioning of it was in 1989, so a long time ago. It was a white paper from the, from the European Commission that mainly said that uh, there should be a synergy between the public sector and the private sector, and that the data that the public sector collects should somehow be emerged back into the, into the private sector for the benefit of the citizens. It's about a 13 pages document. They state about 19 uh, guidelines, and if you look at the guidelines, you will find that most of them are in the uh, are still um, 
uh, valid and stay at the, at the grounds of what open data is now as we know it. Uh, with respect to the community side, uh, the best example that uh, you know, everybody knows is related to the collaborative project of OpenStreetMap that was initiated in 2004. So open data is not a new concept, Phosphor-G, we all know it's not a new concept. Uh, of course, things in time, the community in time learned the, um, how to improve the characteristics and how they should look for an open data, for a data set to be truly open, to be reusable, and so on and so forth. I will not insist um, that much on this, uh, on this topic. What about the European story? So, the European Union in this context, the context of, a, of the story that I want to say, uh, is we're looking at two main things. One is related to the legislative part, and the other one is related to the financial part. So, with respect to the legislation one, um, as I've mentioned, the first idea that public data should be open was in 1989, but it took a long time for the, for the, um, for the community, let's say, for the European Commission to understand that just saying it would be useful would not make it happen. So the first time that a legislative uh, form uh, came about was in 2003 when there was the directive on the reuse of public sector information. This directive uh, for non-Europeans, let's say, uh, a directive is a legislative act that is, um, um, is decided within the European um, Union and then it has to be transposed in each national uh, legislation of each country. So the idea is not to just copy paste the text because the environment in each country is different. So legislation is different, different issues, different problems. So the legislative part have to be very well aware but they have to transpose in the spirit in which it was written. So uh, this directive and it's important, uh, I'll get to that a bit later. Uh, so di this directive went through a series of reviews and updates. And it's, it's important to mention that these were not done just by imagining how things would be. Behind each review and each update, there have been uh, numerous studies trying to understand what is the best way Firstly, to um, release the open data, what data should be released, how it should look like, who is paying for that, and so on and so forth, including uh, aspects related to the economic gain of this decision. Um, so what we have today in the European Union, we have the Open, uh, open Data Directive in 2019. This was the last revision. And you can see ideas from, the open, from this directive that have trickled down in the European Data Strategy, which is a, which is a, a, larger, a larger strategy. But here in the Open Data Directory, an, uh, Directive, another important step has been made, meaning that there have been uh, a decision related to which are the high value uh, data sets that are um, monitored by countries that are collected in, um, uh, in a, in a well-organized manner by various public institutions. And behind these, uh, these decisions there are numerous studies related to, again, what are the characteristics, how they should look like, who are, ma who are making them available, licensing, formats, so on and so forth. Uh, and, of course, uh, during, these, during these studies, the community, the, inter the European community has been, uh, has been um, also, um, we, they've tried to collect feedback from the, from the community as well. So this is one part. So we've decided that phosphor gene open data is not new. Then we have seen that in the European Union um, there has been a push from the, from, let's say, from the above um, uh, top down level for the opening of public, uh, public data. What about the financing and how does that information, you know, goes back to us? us being uh, citizens, being uh, geospatial scientists, being um, 
um, coders, and so on. So, with respect to the financial part, the European Union is also supporting the uh, supporting the entire ecosystem. Uh, with respect to, it doesn't matter if it is a, it's commercial like public, uh, pub, uh, like uh, private companies or universities or research centers. They are supporting it through various funding calls. So our story, the story that I'm telling, is in such a context, meaning that the European Commission has put out through, oh, five minutes. <laughs> Has put out uh, has put out a call saying that okay we have we are interested in making the open data um, more easily accessible uh, and for that we have this connecting Europe facility call and this one um, has led to a series of requirements that we uh, a geo harmonizer um, uh, consortium answered to. So the Geo Harmonizer Consortium was formed by, I'm saying it was formed because the project ended in June 2022. And we were five companies out of five, out of five, um, five different member states uh, and that we have came with a proposal. So the European Commission asked for uh, support for the reuse of information made discoverable. So what is already out there, make it even more discoverable. Uh, easier, uh, more friendly access, generation of cross-border services, providing access to, to these data sets, and so on. The idea is that the program itself is called uh, Connecting Europe Facility, meaning that an important part was uh, on the harmonization of different data sets, because um, that is still a problem, still with Inspire going on for a long time, we still have that, that issue. So, fast forward three years, uh, we have uh, ecodatacube.eu, um, uh, mature, a mature um, uh, web portal with added value uh, um, data products that were related to land cover, to um, um, different um, parameters such as um, land surface temperature, to flooding and so on. So you would think at this point that, okay, we have uh, a web portal, we have the added generated, uh, uh, the um, added value data already, everything, the, the portal is based on uh, Phosphor G, and it's also, um, everything is uh, openly licensed. We have a lot of tutorials on how to download the data, how to, you, how to uh, access it through various, um, through various, um, uh, tools, and you would think that that's enough. That's that's good enough. We've done our job, so we can go and do something else. But it's not really so, because we have noticed that, unfortunately, even if there are a lot of tools available for people that are not focusing only on that on the daily job, is really complicated to uptake on the new data services and the new data products and the new tools that are that exists out there. <coughs> Sorry. So, with the respect of the, with, within the geo harmonizer contact, we had one use case trying to engage as much as possible with a user within Romania. So, with, um, given the data that we generated, the added data uh, value that we generated based on what was already available as open data, data from Copernicus services and uh, other, other, uh, other resources, we have decided to try and work with respect to one hazard that is uh, unfortunately hitting Romania quite constantly, uh, and I, not only Romania, but um, also Romania, and that is flooding. So we have identified the stakeholders. These are institutions, public institutions that work in the, um, uh, with respect to um, monitoring, collecting data, making reporting, and so on. <clears throat> and we have tried to identify how these people can use what we have done. And that happened in the following, in the following uh, way. This public institution, uh, the uh, national, uh, national Administration of Romanian Waters, has, let's say, two main uh, roles. One is to monitor the, um, 
hydro, uh, hydrological environment, let's say. And the other one is to report. They report to the Ministry of Environment in Romania, but they also report to the European Commission to specific agencies, like the uh, European uh, Environmental Protection Agency. And they do that within a legislative framework that comes from the European Union, again directive. So there are two main directives that they answer to, they must comply with. One is related to the water framework and the other one is the floods. So um, this was the first step. And the second step is that in 2006, there was an agreement signed between four partners, Romania, Republic of Moldova, Ukraine and Bulgaria, uh, for the um, um, Lower Danube Green Corridor Agreement. This basically is an attempt in um, renaturing the flow of the Lower Danube. And this is uh, a new concept because it refers to the possibility of living with the waters and not in a more natural way and not building more and more dikes. Um, and I'll get to that in just a few moments. So what happened, we have um, considered the map products that we developed within the project, within the GeoHarmonizer project. Um, and uh, we, the interaction with the user was, we went to them, we said, we have this, we have this, uh, we have this project, we have these data sets, and how can we support you? We know that you are uh, reporting within the uh, floods, uh, within the floods directive, so what can we do? And what they wanted to do was to, under to better understand one of the historical floods that happened in Romania. It was probably one of the biggest one. Um, in 2000 and uh, in 2006, on, you can see those the three the three regions that were most affected. Okay, so uh, what we did was we we created uh, a series of products uh, with respect to the flood extent using MODIS data because in 2006 there was no. Um, there was no uh, 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 Sentinel, no Copernicus available at that time. Uh, and uh, just as an idea, even though we have worked only on the three on the three regions, of course, is an approach that can be used uh, in other regions as well. So that's uh, that's not a, that's obviously not a region, not a problem. Um, we have identified the maximum flood extent. We have calculated some optical indexes. Um, so. Uh, Related to the, uh, to the um, extent of the flood, uh, the water in some regions stayed for more than three, four, five months. So it was really, really intense. And the thing is that uh, the public administration that I mentioned at the beginning did not have the resources or the knowledge to calculate, to, to be able to extract this kind of knowledge from openly available data, modest. Okay, uh, so we've also um, we've also done the flood evolution, as I mentioned, because it 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 extended on a very long period of time, and for each of the regions, we had about uh, 60, I think, about 60, uh, 60 water masks for them to for them to analyze and to try to understand better what has happened in that in that time. So going back to, so that was on, on one side, and with respect to understanding uh, how they can consider at least uh, renaturing the lower Danube region, uh, we have used historic cartographic documents, and what we did was to uh, overlay the maximum water extent that we've got from the, from the satellite data, from MODIS data, and to uh, overlay it with, uh, with, historical, with historical maps. Here you can see the overlay on uh, Austrian map from 1910. And the important thing to see here is the fact that you can see that in the area, the areas that were flooded were actually areas that were used that before of the of the um, building dikes and changing the environment, uh, there were these were areas that were covered by lakes that were covered by, by marsh. So land that can take water in situation that can absorb water in such a case that the um, the localities and the villages around would not be flooded. So w situation that would not occur in the ooh, in the case of uh, when you build. Uh, dikes and you take that land and you use it for agriculture because that is what has happened uh, along the uh, along the Romanian side. 
So here is another, another, um, another uh, historical uh, document, and again the same, uh, the same uh, situation we, we observe. So in the end, this is the Romanian, uh, the Romanian um, uh, Danube, lower Danube, of course, from one, from uh, east to west, and you can see the the flooded the flooded areas for 2006. So, after all of this analysis and the interactions that we had with this public administration, they say, "Oh, your product is great. It's nice. It's really okay. It's really good." We had different discussions because they were they were interested. Some of the technical people were more interested to find out about the limitations, how can they do it. Uh, other people that were less technical, they would want, I don't know, different kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, just export all the data in KML format or things like that. But the thing is that they were interested with what we were doing and they wanted to continue. But here comes the problem, is that, okay, so this was a European project and it ended so what happens now who is how if i start to use this data that is really useful for me what is my guarantee that uh you know i uh, you will do this in two years in three years in five years so you know, rome wasn't built in a day these kind although phosphor g is not a new concept open data is not a new concept until this uh, these new ways of working and this new paradigm actually just um, blends into the way that we function and we work in the private sector, in the public sector, even even the academia, maybe. It takes time. And these kind of stories, we believe that it was successful because we have, we're building a relation with, with these people and they know about us and so on, but it still takes time. Thank you. <laughs>